giving you access to the best minds and ideas in organized real estate. This is the Center for Realtor Development Podcast, a monthly audio treasure trove of information and tips and advice, sponsored by the National Association of Realtors Center for Realtor Development. Our podcast focuses exclusively on realtor education, both formal and informal, from national experts to rock star peers, from sharp novices to seasoned veterans, from big city markets to small town communities. We believe that to keep earning, you've got to keep learning. And now, here's your host, award-winning realtor, acclaimed speaker, and beloved instructor, Monica Neubauer. Welcome to the Center for Realtor Development Podcast. I'm Monica Neubauer, your host for the show. Today, my interview is with Darren Kittleson, and we're going to discuss negotiations in real estate. You know, there's actually a lot of negotiation points in a real estate transaction, and we'll take a look at those. We're going to discuss what is a win-win transaction, and how can we achieve it? We're also going to discuss as agents reacting professionally in a transaction so that we can help our clients achieve the best situation for them. Let me introduce Darren to you. He's been in the real estate industry since 1994. He's the operating principal of two Keller Williams offices in Madison, Wisconsin. He's been in association leadership, and he's also a trainer, speaker, and coach for agents around the country. Join me in welcoming Darren. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Welcome to the Center for Realtor Development Podcast. I'd love to welcome Darren Kittleson. Thank you, Darren, for being on the episode with us today. My pleasure. All right. We're going to talk about real estate negotiations today, but you know, real estate is an area where negotiations are a crucial part of it. But one of the things that's so interesting about real estate negotiations is that the culture in the United States does not necessarily consider itself to be a real negotiation culture, at least not for consumers. We think about it for cars and houses. But the fact is we negotiate far more in our life than I think we realize. And um, Darren and I will bring out a few of those things and hopefully help us as individuals and as realtors to begin to negotiate better and see some of the creative ways we can do that. Are you ready? I am ready. All right, Darren, so what do you think are some of the ways that people negotiate in life? You know, it's interesting to me, and I always say, um, look at a four or five year old and 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 watch how they I mean, I think we're all naturally we're born natural negotiators. And at age four or five, we're honing that skill where we you know, everything's a negotiation at that age group. And somewhere, I think between probably seven and ten, we we beat it out of our children where we, we like squash it. Oh, yeah, and, that's kind of a sad thought, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? But if you think about it and I don't have children, I have uh, nieces and nephews and friends, you know, small kids. I love watching them because, you know, it's like, can I have an ice cream? No. Well, what if I did this? Could I have an ice cream? <laughs> you know, and, and, it, and they're not afraid of hearing no. They just find another way to go at it to try to get the result that they want. And somewhere as we grow older, we kind of lose that. And, and I, so I always think that, you know, if we could go back and, and, and approach negotiation with the attitude of a four or five-year-old, we'd find that two things happen. Number one is that uh, you'll be you'd be surprised at the outcomes you do get because quite often, if you don't ask, you you'll never get, and yet often, if you ask, you might get. And then the second part of it is, I think it's just honing your skills as a as a professional negotiator, as a real estate agent. Um, I travel uh, quite extensively, and it's. Uh, Normally, when I get to a hotel to check in, I'll always negotiate that and I'll say, you know, any opportunity for a better room tonight? Ah, I mean, it's as simple as that. And yeah. So I'll encourage um, the agents that I have a chance to work with and train. I said, you know, bring those skills back. Just ask. Uh, you know, could you do better on price than that in, in, in a consumer experience? And, and the worst thing that can happen is the, the person selling would say no, right? Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. And I, I love that with the hotel. And I've done that sometimes too. just ask and they say yes. And we, even with the situation with the story with the child, we somehow train ourselves to say yes or no to certain things. And so even just beginning to recognize where we say yes and no, because I think with my kids, sometimes I had to train myself to say yes. <laughs> you know, I was programmed right. to say, no, you can't have that. And sometimes I would have to say, well, why not? Um, so it was just a matter of listening, asking and listening and, and entering in the conversation. 
And and uh, along with absolutely right, and along with that, I think it's also not being attached to the outcome or the answer you get. Right. So, you know, I could ask if I can get a better hotel room. I'm not attached to the outcome. I, I know I've got a room no matter what. Yet if I could get upgraded to something nicer, you know, it's kind of a bonus day. And so it's not having the attachment, I think, is the other piece. Uh, and so with with new real estate agents, as an example, you know, when we have a, a training or a discussion about negotiation, I'll say, let's go out and start negotiating on a daily basis now so that you can practice that skill. And then you can call it up when needed in a real estate transaction transaction. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. What other what other ways do you think people negotiate? Um well, I you know I think we negotiate with ourselves all the time, isn't it? You know, mm, yeah. uh, I always think about that and and really uh, in this it's it's really about having an awareness, right? So, uh a simple negotiation if you're on a weight loss plan and there's a you know there's a great piece of dessert sitting on the counter in your office. You know, there's a negotiation that happens there, should I eat it? Should I not? <laughs> you know, is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 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 again, it's just to me, it's just having that awareness and then from that awareness, honing the skill. And I, and I think, you know, in your opening statement, you're right on. I, I've had a chance to travel a fair amount throughout the world. And in almost every culture in the world, there is a negotiation expectation. In fact, in some places I travel, they'll say in a, in a consumer experience or retail experience that if you don't negotiate, you insult the shopkeeper. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I, and I and and that's such a uh, an odd thing for most of us in the U.S. because we were not raised like that. In fact, we're probably raised, like I said, where you know we squash that in in our in our children as they grow a little older <laughs> yeah. because it's not the quote unquote norm here. Um, so you know, so I think there's great opportunity, and I think from a real estate perspective, as a professional, that's one of the value proposition items that really can increase the the value of that agent who. Represents the consumer, and that is if they're a strong negotiator, if they've worked on those skills, if they've practiced those skills, if they've studied it, I believe they bring more to the table, and it could be worth thousands of dollars to the their client. It could be worth a lot of money. I absolutely agree, and and now even with so much information available on the internet for buyers and sellers, that the negotiation part of our value proposition and what we do bring to the transaction is even more important. I absolutely right, and I think that's and if 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 agents aren't improving that skill set, they're missing an opportunity to do an even better job for their client. And so I do think uh, it, it behooves every one of us as real estate professionals to continue to improve that skill because that's really where well, that's one of the ways areas we can bring great value. Uh, and and too often I see agents taking what I would call the path of least resistance. You know, we we train our real estate agents to say, you know, our job is to help buyer and seller get to agreement in a real estate transaction. And that's true. However, our job is also to, to do what's best for the client, if I'm whoever I represent. And sometimes that path of least resistance isn't necessarily best for the client. Right. You know, if I, I might be able to, to get the buyer to pay, you know, $10,000 or $5,000 more than where I know the seller would agree. And in doing so, if the seller is my client, I'm doing what is best for my client, the seller. Right. And so that's really, I think that's another, that's an area from a real estate professional perspective where we can continue to bring great value. Well, now you're, so with real estate, there actually are a number of places in the whole real estate transaction and in the relationship between an agent and a client and other agents. Where are the opportunities for negotiation in a transaction? There's a lot of them. There really are. And I, you know, I think that's the other mistake that uh, agents make is that we think the only negotiation is when there's an offer presented. And yet um, there's multiple times prior to that. I'll just the example, if I'm across the table from a potential seller and they're interviewing me for the role to be their listing agent, that's a negotiation or right. it should be. Yeah. Um, and, the, and those points are, you know, negotiating the market price or the price that it's going to be listed for based on the knowledge the agent has the, of what they can do for the client. Um, that may be a negotiation. Finding out the seller's motivation is a piece of the negotiation because if they're not highly motivated, there may not be a great opportunity to do what's best for them. Um, uh, sometimes the seller will say, you know, could you do better on the commission? So it's interesting, you know, you mentioned that in a retail setting, we don't negotiate 
often yet, quite often on, on the real estate side, that's where the consumer wants to negotiate. And, and I think about this and I go, if I'm an agent and I know what my value is and what I charge for the, uh, for the services I provide and I quickly drop that number if I get asked if I would, how strong of a negotiator am I? Right. And I always think about it because that's my money. So if I don't protect my money at a high level, then how can I protect the consumer's money when we're face to face with an offer? And so, you know, that's another piece of the puzzle. And 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 it isn't only price; it's terms and conditions. It's it's all of that. Um, so you know, so there is a negotiation. Ideally, there's negotiation happening almost every step of the transaction for for the benefit of the client. And that's what I always remind uh, my agents: is like we always, you know, our fiduciary duty is to hold the the interests of our client above all else. And that's that's part of it. Right. And part of that is showing the value that we bring because that value is going to increase our ability to serve our clients better. Right. Um, well, serve them better. And ultimately, you know, price is a piece of the puzzle. Ultimately, get them the best price or the timing that they, they desire, whatever those those must haves are for that client. Well, what uh, are that, a couple of those must haves? Let's kind of touch on that because you're right. It's really not always just about the money. I mean, for some people, that's a really big factor. But some of the other terms, you know, we've learned in our years in real estate that that's not always the the biggest factor. What are some no. of the other ones? Well, and that's and unfortunately, that's where too many agents think the only negotiation happens. Yeah. And yet there's right. so much more. You know, it could be the timing of the sale. Um, in the market of the moment right now, and in most markets across the United States, you know we've got low uh, housing inventory, so not a lot of homes on the market, and a really high demand from the buyer side. Um, so it's not uncommon in some price ranges that when a house goes on the market, it gets multiple offers. And I've seen where the offers will be way above asking price, and yet possibly won't appraise. And so, you know, part of that negotiation in my mind is, you know, making sure that the offer that the the seller ultimately accepts is one that can close. Yes. That the consumer has the op- uh, the ability to do that. Uh, the buyer has the opportunity to do that versus s- simply taking just the highest price and hoping, you know, the stars align. <laughs> Cause well, that right. Because, that happen. yeah, you have mortgage, the types of mortgage could affect if it's going to close or appraise. Um, I had a situation recently for an investor who wanted a conventional loan and the condominium unit had too many units rented. And Mm -hmm. so the financing was bad and that was a big factor. So, you know, the financing is a factor, the closing date, you know, sometimes a couple of extra days of occupancy can be a huge factor for people just for peace of mind. And, you know, it's interesting you talk about that. That's one of the strategies that some agents are using who represent buyers is that they will, knowing if they're that they're competing, they'll make an offer with uh, with extra time for the seller to move out after closing. And, you know, that's the that's the piece of the puzzle that got their offer accepted. Yeah. Uh, And again, that's just a negotiation. It's a strategy to get the outcome that, you know, is best for the client who you represent. And so that's the other word I love using in negotiation really is the word strategies. So what are the strategies for success? And it's not always simply being the highest offer, highest priced offer. Right. Uh, there's there's more to it. And so that, and again, it's it's thinking the whole process through versus simply going, you know, you, you got to go in with the highest price you can possibly offer. And that's all we're going to think about. Well, that transitions into my next question, actually, is because most people want to have a negotiation end where everybody feels good about it. Uh, Yes. That doesn't mean they don't want to feel like they got what they wanted. You know, we all still kind of want to get what we want. But, you know, when a transaction goes well and if the buyer and seller were to meet at closing, there's still a congenialness there, a friendliness there. There are agents and clients who do want to have a win-lose. I don't want to, you know, that's out there. But most people want to have a feel-good feeling when it closes. Um, So what are some of the ways, because we just discussed it's not always money, that people can have that win-win even when it's not the most obvious items? You know, and that's a great question. And and I think, I mean, to the point of the win-lose, you're absolutely right. There are people whose philosophies are that I've got to win and and the other side has to lose. And, you know, in those scenarios, though, here's what's interesting. And I imagine the the people listening to this could probably think of times that this has happened. If we get to agreement and it's a win-lose, the minute something 
uh, shows up in the transaction between the agreement uh, and the, the closing or settlement, uh, that's that's that makes that transaction prone to blow apart. Mm. You know, they're, yeah. it's, they're quicker to react. There's there's higher emotion typically from uh, the buyer or the seller. The, the, really, the higher emotions are from the party that felt that they lost. Right. And so the minute something uh, surprise shows up, which happens in some real estate transactions, if it was a win lose negotiation, chances of it staying together uh, are less. Right. So that's why I always say, you know, the goal is to go in with a win-win uh, approach. And, and I think that starts by setting that expectation with the client from the very beginning of the process. So it starts with the client as well. And say, you know, Mr. Mrs. Uh, buyer or Mr. Mrs. Seller, whoever I represent, my job when we find the right property is to help you negotiate it to what you would consider a win-win. And let me tell you why. You know, and so I set the stage from the very beginning for the consumer. And, and the reason for that is I want to, you know, the ultimate goal for that, bu- that buyer or seller is a closing. And so yeah, that, that's right. going to help us get to that. Um, you know, the, the question I think you asked you know, was around uh, what are some of the other areas? I always think that one of the best strategies that an agent can have in, uh, in structuring an offer is to get in touch with the agent on the other side of the transaction before the negotiation starts and start asking for information. Now, they mean they, they're not obligated to provide a lot of it, yet there are some pieces of information that might be helpful. You know, what would be the ideal closing date for your seller? Um, is there anything else about the transaction that the seller would really like to have that I, you know, that I should know? Those types of questions. And, and, and I, when I ask those questions, there's two things I'm doing with the other agent. And that is one, I'm building rapport. And so building rapport with them prior to the negotiation is helpful. And the second thing is I'm, get, I'm trying to gather information that can help us structure a negotiation in such a way that could set up for a win-win even faster. And I think that's the other piece. And so I can't stress enough communication uh, with the other agent is is really a crucial step in the beginning of a negotiation. And when I say communication, I want to be really clear. It's voice to voice, whether mm-hmm. it's in person yes. or if it's on the phone. Um, you know, too often, I think we rely on technology to communicate and, and it doesn't always come through as effective as it would voice to voice. So get on the phone with them, get face to face with them, ask questions, build rapport. And that begins to set up the relationship for the win-win negotiation. I completely agree with you about the phone calling. Just, uh, and we'll come back to that and talk about that a little bit more. But I was thinking about what you say when you call the seller or the buyer, when you talk to the other agent beforehand and you find out a few terms. So if I'm representing the buyer and I'm bringing an offer into a multiple offer situation, I've talked to the agent. I know some of the terms that are important to that seller. Those may cost my buyer nothing to give those. So it may be just such an easy win to give to that other party the perception of a win when to my side, you know, it may have been a non-factor. So Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's so much. And um, talk to us about perception and reality. What do you think about that with the (laughs) those going together? You know, I think that the key in, in a negotiation is to recognize that Everybody will have their own perception uh, coming into it, and that really is their reality. So, you know, my job isn't to change their reality. It's to work within the realm of what they believe to be true. And and, and that's – and I think recognizing that everybody comes with that is the key because too often – well, I always think about it this way. You know, people don't resist unless there's resistance, mm. right? So if I, if I were to, to push on someone, they're just instinctively we push back. You know, in a negotiation, I don't want pushback. So I don't – you know, in order to avoid that, I can't be pushing. So it really is to say, you know, it's to be – we're collaborative even though you – know, I, I, I always think about it this way. There's the – there's an old Warner Brothers cartoon of the sheepdog and the coyote. And uh, I don't know if you remember this or ever saw, but the the they walk together to the the, the – punch the time clock in the morning, visiting like great friends. Uh, once they punch in, you know, they're, they're constantly going back and forth against each other. The coyote's trying to steal the sheep and, he, and the, the sheepdog's trying to protect the sheep. And then as soon as the uh, whistle blows at the end of the day, they, they <laughs> clock out and they're friends again. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that one. <laughs> We're friendly and I, until we get into our combative job, right? <laughs> right. And, and really, that's, that's, in my mind, that's how this needs to be too. I mean, I'm going to advocate like a bulldog for, or a sheepdog in this 
this instance for my client, you'd understand that at the end of the day, when we get to that agreement, you know, the, the other negotiator and I can be friends. It's not about making them bad and wrong ever. It's about doing, again, what's best for the client. And and I and I always think about it that way. When when we can operate like that from a from the professional side of things, the outcomes become greater. You know, and I just had one more thing. I talked about emotion a moment ago from the consumer side. That you know, this is an emotional thing for buyers and sellers. I get it. Yes. What we have to be very careful about as as negotiators is it's not an emotional thing for us. Or it shouldn't and, be an emotional thing for well, us. Well, if we yeah, that's true. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can think of a few times when it has felt emotional and I had to had to, you know, change my perspective a little bit. (laughs) That's it, though. And so that awareness, though, that for the best outcome for your client, it is for you to to be the professional. Right. And stay as neutral as you possibly can. I can advocate at a strong level for what's best for my client. I can do it unemotionally. Now, did that does that take work? Absolutely. Does it take uh, awareness? Absolutely. And yet the outcomes are greater when I can do that. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the other things from a real estate professional perspective that we can all work on on a daily basis. Because, you know, I, I jokingly say, you know, this is one of the few industries I know where we can go from the heights of glory to the depths of depression in 10 minutes from 8 a.m. until 8, 10 <laughs> because of a phone call. Right. Right. And so it, it is, a, it can be a roller coaster that way. Yet when we're, if we're doing what's best for our client, we can't let that impact it. And that's, I think that's another piece of negotiation strategy or skill set that we have to constantly be working on. I agree completely because it's recognizing who the parties are in the negotiation. You know, we have, We talked about when we first meet with clients and there's some negotiation there, but in the contract negotiations or repair negotiations, when you have the agents, they are the negotiators and the client is the party for whom we are negotiating. And we as agents, we need to, as you just said, be professional and not be emotional. You know, if we get emotional, we need to work that out and get it away because how can we positively affect a transaction if we're feeling angry or upset or some negative emotion. That's not going to bring any good energy to our clients or to the other negotiators in the party. So we have got to deal with that and not let that, you know, not let that take over or even become a factor. Well, you're absolutely right. And quite often, all, all that does, if you bring emotion into it, is amplifies the emotion of your client. Oh, totally. It totally does. Our our attitude can affect how they respond completely. Yes, absolutely. And again, I always go back and say, okay, my job is to help them get to agreement with the other side. That's my job. And my job is to do what's best for them. It's not to, it's not to share, you know, emotional opinion. It's not, you know, all of those things that come into play sometimes. And I, and I think that just makes our jobs more difficult when we find ourselves doing that. So it's, you know, it's, it's really being able to remove it. And that doesn't mean that you don't care about your client. In fact, it means you do care. You care so much that you're willing to suppress whatever's coming up for you in order to get what's uh, best for them. And I, and I think when we approach it that way, we, we ultimately end up with better outcomes uh, for our client. And one of the things that helps me when I'm in a negotiation is to recognize um, the personality types of all of my parties involved, um, kind of their motivations going on behind the scenes. Because if I can recognize, <clears throat> I was in a transaction once and a problem came up and it was going badly and the agent, um, it, it really was her fault, the situation, but rather than come to me and want to collude together and have a good idea for how we can make this great for our client, she came at me in an accusatory way. So, you know, of course my initial reaction was to be upset, but once right. I realized it, I could realize that she was upset because she had made a mistake. So she was also feeling embarrassment and was struggling with how to work it out from her side. And once I realized her emotions that were involved, that gave me empathy in the situation. And then I, that helped me calm down. And ultimately we did work something out. So whenever I am able to recognize the cause of other people's feelings, whether it be the client or the other negotiator, it always helps me calm down and come up with a better solution. 
And that's that's such a great analogy. Yeah, you know, I always think about this that the the two words that most of us love hearing are "you're right," and and so that validation in that scenario is just to say you're know, something like even I can understand why you're so upset. Or I, I get it or, you know, some, it just you put yourself on their side of the table for that moment and all of a sudden you're now an ally with them versus an adversary. Yeah. And that's really what you described in that and in using it. And that's and to me, that's that's a negotiation skill as well is uh, is really being able to get the uh, other side to see uh, a perspective that you've got and, and have them work side by side with you. So that's great. I love that analogy. Well, and, and having one of the things that real estate has helped me a lot is I have developed the ability to speak more clearly and use tact. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I didn't grow up talking that way. Ask my friends from high school. You know, I'm a very direct person. But as I'm just in real estate and as I've stepped back to kind of ponder how things have gone and, you know, and the mistakes that I've made. Uh, tact has been a huge thing for me. And I've had brokers say to me, Monica, can you come and teach us about communication and teach my people how to talk well to each other? And that, you know, so I encourage all the agents to try and figure out the best way to say it, taking that high road and what's the best way, the most neutral language to use to, um, to try and get what you need for your client. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because I always think about it this way, recognizing that the transaction can be emotional for the buyer and can be emotional for the seller. I always think that my role as the professional in between is to be the filter. Yeah. So emotionally, you know, uh, the client might react with whatever they say. That doesn't mean that I, I take exactly what they say verbatim and communicate right. it to the other side. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, our, our job is to filter and, and the filter is to take the emotion out and communicate the intent. Yes. And, and, and that's really and, and again, uh, and that's really where I, I still believe one of the dying art uh, forms we've got in negotiation is is voice to voice communication. Yes. Um, you know, and I've seen this happen far too often where an agent chooses to only communicate or negotiate via text or email. And then all of a sudden, one of the threads is the you know emotional outburst of the consumer. And that gets passed along to the other side. Now, now we've just got a huge mess because now we've got even more emotion in the mix. And I'm like, so why would you do that? You know, why wouldn't you just pick up the phone and say, you know, here's what my client's desires are versus, you know, whatever the client said. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Which gets back to motivation, understanding our client's motivation and what's really important to them and and even, you know, thinking there might be some people, uh, some consumers listening to this podcast, if you as a consumer can express to your agent what you really want, that can help them better negotiate. You know, I mean, if we understand that you're moving because of the grandkids, we we understand that and the feeling that goes with that. But sometimes the language we use or even... When a consumer is beginning in the transaction, they may not even fully realize the own de their own depth of motivation of something that's become important to them until they get into the transaction. So the motivation is a constant journey, understanding motivation. We need to always be trying to discern that in our clients. Right. You, you know, and what's interesting, and you're right on that. And to me, what's interesting is I, we're the professionals. So we're, we're in this conversation every day with buyers and sellers, uh, recognizing that our consumer, uh, I think the uh, National Association of Realtors statistic is they're moving once every, it was at eight to 10 years now. Yeah. So if we think about it, if they're, you know, if, if they own property now, it was probably eight or 10 years ago, the last time they were in this conversation and, and a lot of life has happened for them. We, we work in this every day. And so I think uh, as an agent, our job is to be uh, the person to ask the right questions, to dig deep enough to understand truly what is important to the client. And, and that's why, you know, if I don't start the conversation with a potential seller with a lot of questions to really get to understand what's important for them, I'm probably doing them a disservice. And especially with the buyer in today's market, if I don't sit down in, and do a, a really thorough consultation with them and really dig down 
and find out what the most important pieces are, I'm doing them a disservice as well. And so from, you know, from the consumer side, I think if I'm looking for an agent that I'm going to hire to represent me, I'd want to make sure they do that. And I, and I always think about it this way, like if, you know, if I wake up with a splitting headache tomorrow and I, I go to my doctor and he goes, what's wrong? I said, I woke up this morning with a splitting headache and he goes, brain surgery, we're going to schedule it, you know, at two o'clock this afternoon. I'm going to go, wait, 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 you know, you should probably do a few more tests. Let's ask a few more questions. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure I want you to crack my skull open. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, you know, and yet in the, in the real estate transaction, sometimes that's how agents uh, approach it. And I, and I just think, again, we're doing the consumer a disservice if we don't dig deep enough and find out, help them really discover what's important to them. And then, and then the other piece of this is even though I discover that on the front end of the, of the working together relationship, it's possible that that motivation could change yes. through the course of that timeline. And so I think it's always important also from an agent perspective to revisit motivation each and every time we're having a conversation that's leading to that sale. Because it might change. I agree. Um, you know, and, and often and it I does. Yeah. And I, and it, yeah. And if I don't know that, um, again, I can't do the best job for my client. And I'm never going to uh, assume that the client's responsibility is to tell me that their motivation has changed without me asking. Right? Because, again, I'm the professional. I'm in this conversation every day. They do this once every eight to ten years. And I think that's the thing as real estate agents we always have to remember. Yes, we need to ask because they might they might not even see it. They're in the midst of this big transaction and so much is going on and they might not fully see, you know, from the outside perspective that we can see what's going on in their life. Right, exactly right. Again, we're we do, we're in these conversations every day. Yes. That's the difference. And yeah. and again for them this is, you know, once every 10 year, 8 to 10 years. So yeah. Uh, Okay, you have talked several times, you've mentioned several times, and I completely agree with you about getting on the phone and calling agents or talking to them face-to-face when you're at association events or you know out in the community, maybe even meeting them to give them the offer or something. Um, that kind of shocked me when I got one at my office recently, <laughs> but um, we tend to do so much electronically. Can you talk about some pros and cons as you see it with the actual texting or emailing or using the phone? Yeah, you know, and it, I again, I think it's a dying art. Uh, you know, there was a there was a study done years ago by a guy named Dr. Morabian about uh, effectiveness in our communication. So that was the the thing they looked at, and they said fifty five percent of our effectiveness in communication is body language. So you know, face to face with someone, body language fifty five percent effectiveness. Thirty eight percent of our effectiveness uh, was in uh, our tonality or rate of speech. So, you know, you can hear a lot in the way someone's speaking about what emotion might be behind it, that type of thing. And then 7% are the words we use. And so I looked at that and say, okay, so in the text and email world, we only have 7% effectiveness. And there are times that that's, uh, that tool is a good efficiency tool, and yet I don't believe it's ever a great efficiency tool in the times of a negotiation because you can't get inflection or rate of speed. You, you can't get a sense of you know where emotionally the other side is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so from that respect, I go, if, you know, if I'm going into negotiation and I could have, you know, 45% effectiveness being a phone call, or I could have just 7% being text or email, which would I choose? And I think in what's best for my consumer, I'm going to want more effectiveness. Now, ideally, you know, I'd like a hundred percent and that'd be face to face with body language. So that's the first thing to remember. Now I, I think about this too, that email and text becomes a permanent record of what's being said too. It's archived. Right. So, you know, the, and not to say that there's anything that we, we would ever speak to someone that we wouldn't want printed, yet that, you know, speech disappears, printed material stays. <laughs> and so, well, that can have a positive and a negative, of course, both of those go both ways. But if we're just, if we're having a conversation with, some time, with someone, sometimes we can just discuss possibilities. Yes. When, when they're in writing, they seem more like counter offers or distinct opinions of our clients. Um, But when we're talking on the phone, we can be a little bit more creative about it and do a little bit more wondering about things. 
you know, and that technique of wondering is a powerful one in a negotiation because it's a way to gather more information that could affect the outcome. And so you're absolutely right. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I, I have two brokerages and about 230 agents that I supervise. Um, and every once in a while, if I'm on the road, I'll get this really long email from an agent about a transaction that is going sideways somehow. And the first thing I do is I pick up the phone and I call the agent. And they'll say, well, you didn't have to call me. You could have just done it in email. I'm like, no, <laughs> this is what we do. I, you know, I want to hear what you're saying. And so uh, you know, we'll talk about it. And, the, and they'll say, well, the last interaction I had with the agent on the other side is they yelled at me. And I go, really? They yelled at you? And they go, yeah. And I said, so when you spoke with them, they yelled at you? And they go, well, no. However, the last text was all in capital letters. And I go, oh, that's yelling. Okay. So to me, that's just such a blatant example of how we only, with only the words, we have no idea of what's behind it, right? Right. Because I said to that agent this night, I said, you know, I have to apologize to you. I said, because sometimes I move so fast, I hit the caps lock key and I just type an email all out in capital letters. And I didn't realize I was yelling. You know, it's like, right. We don't all have all those cultural nuances of other people's situations. Absolutely no, right. Yeah, Yet voice to voice, you would really know if someone was yelling at you. Yes. <laughs> right? so, and yes, you definitely would know then. <laughs> you know, yeah. And so, you know, and that's, you know, kind of a silly example, yet that plays out in reality. And I'm just going, wow. Yeah, it fascinates me that that's where we take this. And even more than to the point of why it's important, I think, to get voice to voice. You know, and you mentioned something a, a few minutes ago, and I, and I don't want to lose this point, because you said as we're out in the community and interacting with agents, you know, one of the other strategies or techniques, to, I think, to help you do better for your client is to build great relationships with the other real estate agents in your market. And 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 I'll tell you that – Countless times, I know that's helped get outcomes that are great for my client because of them. Yes. Because we've got a relationship, because we've dealt with each other before on a professional level. Uh, I can advocate on behalf of my client at a stronger level because the agent knows that, you know, how I do business. And I think those are the those are all the subtle pieces to the professional agent's career that make a difference. Well, and, and, and so I, I want to make sure for the real estate agents listening to this that that they don't overlook the the power of that. You know, being involved in the trade associate in our associations, in our uh, other organizations where we interact with other agents and build rapport and relationship become powerful tools when it comes time to negotiate. They really, really do. And and when I ask in my classes, how many of you have gotten a transaction? You have perhaps been the winning, the winning offer in a multiple offer situation because you had a relationship with that agent, many hands go up because, mm -hmm. you know, they may choose to negotiate with them. They may still get a better price, but the agent on the other side knows when they know you're professional, they know the transaction is going to go better for their client as well. It just creates a better atmosphere when there's that relationship. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yep. Well, all right. In the book, Getting to Yes, which is an excellent book on negotiation by Fisher, Yuri, and Patton, they talk about separating the people from the problem. Now, negotiations are not always a problem, but they it is a situation where there's not usually an agreement, so it does need a solution. And so do you have any more suggestions? We've talked about this a little bit, but about helping the people separate the people in the transaction from the need to resolve the differences. Well, and I, I think that goes back to the the whole idea of of recognizing you know who the professionals in the transaction are, and that's us as the real estate agent, and really uh, removing the emotion. Because um, I, I don't think we can speak enough about when yeah. when we bring emotion in, then the problem and the people get blended. Right. Uh, and you mentioned this a few minutes ago. You know, our job really is to to take the scenarios that we've got and filter out. And communicate effectively what 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 really are the issues at hand, in you know the bullet points of the negotiation. Here you know here's here are the here's point A, point B, point C, point D. You know, and this this is what we're looking at. 
um, versus the emotion of, and, and I've had this happen where we'll get to the end of a negotiation uh, and the seller would say something like, well, if that blankety blank buyer hadn't tried to steal this house by such a low ball offer that insulted me at the beginning, I would let it go for this. Or, or they'll or they'll not let a transaction go forward because of a refrigerator or something. You know, that's right. a, a couple hundred dollar item for a multiple thousand dollar deal. Yeah. And and, and so you know, that to me is another part of a skilled negotiator sets expectations from the beginning, and from the beginning with their their client as well as with the other side, so that it is about just the issues and it's not about the emotion. Uh, and and again, I think the, the the better we get as as agents to keep our emotions out of the mix. Uh, and when I say our emotions out of the mix, I don't mean just in communicating with the other side. I believe it's also in communicating with our client. Yes. Uh, because sometimes we get hooked into that too, and we'll get you know. And again, that only amplifies what's going on emotionally for them. Our job is to is to get them to agreement and do what's best for them. And and I don't think we do our jobs well when we get emotionally uh, worked up as well. No. And I want to go back to something you said about you've referenced a couple of times. If we educate them from the beginning, uh, negotiations start at the beginning. They start with preparation. They start with education. And if we're prepared and our clients are prepared, we've educated them about the market. We've educated them about loan products and potential problems. Proactive Proactive work in negotiations from the beginning can make a transaction much smoother because people know what to expect. Absolutely. And I and I think that we owe that to the consumer. You know, here's the thing I guess that that, that I'm always kind of fascinated by as well, that um, I'll hear a first time buyer specifically go, uh, we finally got an accepted offer on a house. We're so excited. And, and then the next thing they'll say is, and we never want to go through that process again. And I'm like, wow. So what happened that when they got to that moment that they should be just so excited and continue to feel good that they'd say, we never want to go through that again. Mm, yeah. And I would and I would venture to guess that in almost every case, it's because the expectations weren't clearly set at the beginning. And the, and they weren't managed through the process because then you know because they everyone came in with their own perception and it wasn't managed in a way that had them have the process be one that they not only did they understand that quite frankly we'd want them to to enjoy yeah so that so that they wouldn't be reluctant you know the next time around to to, to get into the market again. Uh, and I just think that comes from the, the that's our that's our role as the real estate professional to to really have those conversations and manage that piece. And we're managing it and educating our clients all through the process because we can't just start out at the beginning of it and everybody understand everything. It's an ongoing um, education process and opportunities will rise during the transaction to have those conversations. And we need to have those conversations before we move into negotiations. You know, it's interesting. I had a, a student in one class I taught. This was up in uh, Ontario, Canada. And she said um, she had bought and sold four properties in her life before she got into real estate sales. And she said, I never understood any of the process. Wow. She said, now that I really understand the process, I'm so clear that I want to make sure whoever I represent understands it as clearly as I do so that there's no uh, – because she goes, without the understanding, everything was upsetting. Because I didn't understand what was going on. Mm. And I go, you know, so I always think about that and go, not only is our job to set expectations uh, up front, it's also to educate along the way and and communicate and educate. And I think that's all, again, we're, you know, we're dialoguing about negotiating, but that's all part of this. It I is. think we can be more effective when who we represent understands the process and, and they're communicated with at a high level through the whole process. Well, it's a reminder that the negotiations do not occur just when we have an offer. It's it's all through the process and education is part of it. So yes. that's part of the understanding of this is, is that honestly, some agents who may not think they're good negotiators, but they might be good educators, they might be better negotiators than they realize because they're doing those less known parts of the negotiation strategy well. So they may actually be better at it than they give themselves credit for. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and, and 
and they shouldn't stop it. <laughs> you know, yeah, keep, keep it up, right? It up. <laughs> Those happy clients exactly. are that way for a reason. So, you know, whatever you've been doing, keep doing it. <laughs> well, you know, and, and here's what happens with that, though. You know, that not only ends a transaction with a happy client, that client is more likely to go out and tell their friends, coworkers, and relatives that if they've got a real estate need, they should work with that agent. So to me, it's just a business strategy. If I want to build a viable long-term business, that's that's a key component in my strategy is is to be that educator and strong negotiator. Well, and when you have a transaction that's gone well um, and a client tells another person about that agent, one, of course, that does help the agent build their business. But I think of that, too, as we should be advocating for vendors we love with our friends because there are vendors and agents who may not give quite as good a level service. So if you do have someone who you work with, please share that so that your friends can have excellent experiences as well. If you've got a good person. You know, uh, that reminds me of a story. I had a number of years ago, I had dinner with the editor of our, (laughs) our regional newspaper and his wife and his wife asked me, she goes, you know, Darren, what was the best real estate transaction you've ever done? And I think she was expecting me to say, you know, it was some multi-million dollar deal or, you know, maybe some celebrity client, that type of thing. And I said, you know, the best transaction I've ever done is the one where we get to the closing table and at the end of the closing, my client says, thank you so much. That was easy. Mm, I agree. Yeah. And I said, that's the best one in the world. I said, you know, along the way, you know, things go wrong. And yet if uh, if it's handled correctly so we can get that outcome, that's the best result. Now, the flip side of that is and in almost every market, there are agents who just like there's agents who believe that every negotiation has to be win lose. I think there are agents who have to create feel they have to create a problem during the transaction so that they can fix it and look like a hero. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'm like, and, and I have one in particular that I've uh, worked with in my market. I'm going, you know, their cus- their client doesn't say that was easy at the end. Their client goes, oh my gosh, that was so difficult to get through. I'm and exhausted. I'm like, yeah. And I'm going, how is that helping? Right. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. um, well, let's close with this one last concept about thinking outside the box and creative negotiations. Uh, and I actually have a uh, something that just happened to me this week that I'll put out there, you know, to kind of spur your thoughts on this is sure. when we think outside the box. So I've been negotiating with, um, in a transaction and the price was not coming together. The other, the agent representing the seller, they had gotten some feedback about the condition. And we have, of course, that had been a factor in our pricing. So in her negotiation back with me, the seller had considered that doing some of those repairs or commercial improvements would be less expensive than taking the hit on it from an offer. So the counter came back with, you know, that the seller was going to paint these two rooms and um, take down some wallpaper. And I was just so impressed with that the recognition of what people were saying and how to make a quick change and how to really improve value. Because we know that people who are going to do the work, often they don't really want to do the work. People are usually willing to pay more when the work is all done. Um, So I just appreciated her quick action and then really willing to come back to the table with something of value, not just this nickel and diming kind of thing. Well, you know, in, in that example, again, she looked at the broader picture versus simply the where you were stuck on price. Yes. So, you know, and, and, and in doing so, she, you know, she may have fulfilled one of the negotiating sticking points for your buyer, which was obviously the condition. So yes. if they could improve that. Now maybe we can get to agreement. Your buyer might come up. Yeah, you see, that's that is out. That is about our. Well, as you were telling the story, I'm going. Well, that's our job, isn't it? It's to say, okay, it, we we came at it this way, and that's not working. What if we go at that this way? Because ultimately, our job is to get buyer and seller to agreement. And how we do that is where the the skilled negotiator comes in, right? Versus, uh, it's all about price. It's only about price, and price is the final thing. <laughs> Right. Right. There's so much more. And and we need to be thinking of that. 
Um, well, you know, and when you talk about it from a condition perspective, I you know, we we kind of started uh, on this conversation about you know negotiation begins right at the front end of meeting with a consumer. I use a seller as an example. I think that conversation that we have with sellers when we we're talking about listing their home around condition and getting the home market ready because of the outcomes that that could give them uh, is again where negotiation starts. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes, and I don't know if this is true, although it may be our perception that the seller might think we only do that because we want the sale to be easier for us. And, and quite frankly, uh, that's not true. The sale is the sale. Uh, if we can make it smoother, it's typically the our client who emotionally has a better experience than we do. Well, well, right. right. It makes for a better emotional experience and it will probably result in more money. Exactly right. And and uh, and maybe uh, helping them get the other terms and conditions that they're looking for in the transaction. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. So. Well, let's wrap this up. I want you to tell us a little bit about the class that you teach, the real estate negotiation experts. And I know you really enjoy teaching that. So tell us a little bit about that and uh, how agents might engage in some more education. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, this is a certification called the Real Estate Negotiation Expert, or the acronym is R-E-N-E. And uh, this course was created back in 2016. So it's it's relatively fresh out of the box from the Real Estate Business Institute, REBI. And, and what they looked at was there, I think there was kind of a gap in skill set for agents around this topic of negotiation. So it's a two-day certification. Um, in it, not only are we teaching strategies, techniques, planning, uh, all of those parts of how to really be successful in negotiation, we actually role play in uh, case studies uh, a number of different types of negotiations. And, and I, I chuckle because one of the very first ones is an exercise really in the first half hour of the very first day. And I think what happens in that one is it really – it's a wake up call to almost everybody in the course going, you know what? I'm not as good as a negotiator as I thought, as a negotiator as I thought I was. And that really kind of sets the tone for the, the learning over the next two days. And, and from that, you know, we are teaching agents how to improve that skill set. And I think ultimately in improving that skill set, we're improving our, our opportunities to represent our clients at a higher level and quite frankly, to generate more income in our businesses because uh, we can do a higher level of business for the people we represent. Absolutely. And I also teach that class. And I want to say if anybody's listening and they think, oh, no role playing, I don't want to do that. Inevitably, at the end of the course, that has been their most favorite part of the class. Do you get that feedback too? Yeah, every time, every yeah. time. And, and it's, you know, and, and it's fun because we're not necessarily role-playing real estate negotiations. So, right, there's some, uh, there's some other stuff there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we do have fun with it too. And, and, you know, and there's nothing that says as adult learners, we can't be in a course, uh, learn a lot and have some fun while we do it. And that's the other part of the class that I enjoy teaching. <laughs> yep, yep. So everybody has a good time and they come out just, so much more encouraged with the new tips that they've learned. So I'm with you. I encourage folks to take it as well. Well, um, do you have any last final thoughts that you want to leave us with? Uh, I, I have two actually for the, for the real estate agents listening to this, um, your skill improvement on becoming even better as a negotiator really is your opportunity to generate more income in your business. I think that's one of your best value propositions and, and is the one that can allow you to get paid more and more. And and so I, I want to just say that there's a there's value in that. And and for the, if the consumer's listening to it, um, when I say get paid more and more, I don't mean that you know they're gouging uh, our, our consumers. In fact, it's just the opposite, that a skilled negotiator in your corner quite often is going to help you uh, gener uh, either get the, uh, buy the property at a lower price or be able to sell at a higher price or meet the other terms and conditions that are most important to you. So I think from the consumer perspective, if I was interviewing an agent, one of the things I'd like to get clear about is their, their negotiating skills. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Darren, I just enjoyed our conversation so much and thank you so much for bringing your wisdom to the table and the conversation. I think it's going to be a huge help to agents and to the consumers who are listening. Thank you. You're welcome, Monica. My pleasure. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Center for Realtor Development podcast. To get more information about the courses and the official NAR credentials and programs discussed in this podcast, visit our online learning platform 
at www.onlinelearning.realtor. As a special thank you to you, our loyal listeners and subscribers, please feel free to use coupon code PODCAST, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, anytime and as many times as you want to obtain 15% off any regularly priced course at our site. Also, be sure to sign up at our site to get on our email list so that you don't miss out on our monthly featured and sale courses, one-day flash sales, and other special promotions and content. And now, back to the show. Thanks for joining us on this episode from the Center for Realtor Development. I hope you've learned some good things that are going to help you improve your business. You know, if you want to get some more training on any of the topics that we're discussing, there are a couple of really excellent places for you to find out where classes are occurring. And these are going to be designation and certification courses. You can go to training4re.com. That's the number four, training4re.com to find out where live classes are occurring that you might have an interest in in your state, in your area, or maybe somewhere you'd like to take a vacation to. So you can see where a class you're interested in is offered in another association. That one's at training4re.com. If you really like online learning, you know, NAR has a lot of classes online and many of them are certified in your state for CE. You can find those at onlinelearning.realtor, onlinelearning.realtor. That's the homepage for the Center for Realtor Development where you can get your classes, designations, and otherwise for your CE and ongoing education. And before I head out, I want to tell you that we're planning some things for NAR Annual. So I hope when you're there that you'll come to the expo and check us out at the Realtor booth. We look forward to seeing you at the expo at NAR and we'll see you on our next episode. Have a great month. Thanks for listening to the Center for Realtor Development Podcast with our dear friend and host, Monica Neubauer. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll give us a positive rating on iTunes and pass along our podcast web address, crdpodcast.com, to your friends and colleagues. If you want to never miss an episode and get access to premium content, download our mobile app for iOS by searching on Center for Realtor Development and iTunes. Any questions or suggestions for future show topics or ideas about how we can improve, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Just send an email to crd at realtors.org. This show is sponsored by the Center for Realtor Development, an online learning platform owned and operated by the National Association of Realtors. We look forward to continuing our conversation next month.